Well, another ZI atomic test is history now. Past history for the record books and live history for future planning. It was a double-headed test like Buster Jangle and Tumblr Snapper, covering both weapon development and civil and military effects. And in some ways, it was our biggest research job so far. The preparation job was big, too. Many hundreds of tons of material and months of intense planning and labor by skilled personnel were the ingredients. Poured into a gigantic test tube, our Nevada proving grounds. In the spring of 1953, the mixture boiled up in a series of 11 atomic detonations. Operation Upshot Knothole. The residue or end product of the reaction was knowledge. Some of it in a yes or no form, immediately useful. And some of it requiring detailed analysis. The funnel into our Nevada test tube was the same old road up from Las Vegas. Nearly 80 miles of standard desert road which carries very little traffic when the proving grounds are quiet. Indian Springs was still primarily an Air Force support station for atomic test operations. The Desert Rock Troop encampment was in the same old place off to the left, after we turned off Highway 95. Inside the check gate and Mercury were living and technical areas and the field headquarters of the main test organization, a joint AEC and Department of Defense activity. From Mercury, the road goes roughly northward. It cuts through one range of hills. On across the valley of Frenchman Flat, then heads up into a notch in a second range. In this notch is the CP, the control point, the real nerve center and communications hub of the test site. This was the test manager's forward headquarters for the series, and primarily the center of operations for the weapons development program, Upshot. Looking out from the control point, an observer can see both of the major blast areas. Frenchman Flat, a dry lake bed, is still visible back in the valley we just crossed, though the actual ground zero point can't be seen. Yucca Flat lies on northward, in the next valley beyond the control point. Nine of Upshot Knothole's 11 shots were fired out here on Yucca, between March 17th and June 4th. These nine, Seven tower shots and two airdrops were the AEC's weapon development test. While such tests are not the main point of this film, their trend, the goals they're aimed at, are ultimately of great importance to the military services. So since these tests are primarily the concern of Los Alamos scientific laboratories, we turn to Los Alamos for an outline of the concepts and the objectives involved. As usual, we're up to our necks, unraveling what happened in the last tests and getting ready for the next ones. Now, this weapon development business. We've been getting together some material for brief orientation talks. I want to emphasize that the amount of discussion given each shot is no indication of its actual importance. In fact, I may have to say at least about some of the most important shots. Shot number two had for its source of energy a boosted fission device. It was part of a development that we think will eventually give us a weapon of approximately 30 inches in diameter. Three to 4,000 pounds weight and a yield in the neighborhood of 500 kilotons, around 35 times that of the Hiroshima bomb. The next development shots were three and five. Shot number four, it was the first airdrop on upshot and was detonated at approximately 6,000 feet, the highest burst of any gadget we've ever fired. So, once over lightly at least, that winds up the story of Operation Upshot Knotholes 
Weapon Development Program. But outside of any discussion, outside of the laboratories, out on the Nevada Proving Ground itself, there was a great deal more to consider than the basic ideas back of the upshot firings. There was the same old job, complex and vitally necessary, of diagnosing the actual performance of gadgets being tested. Gadgets designed by Los Alamos and by Project Whitney of the University of California Radiation Laboratory. It's an old story, in a sense, to those of us in the services who have watched and assisted the preparation of previous tests. But that doesn't alter its prime value. To get the inside dope on the behavior of any experimental fission device, the scientists always want at least the answer to one classical three-headed question. What was the alpha rate, the transit time, and the yield? And yield alone is computed and cross-checked in many ways probably most accurately by radiochemical analysis of cloud material collected by the sampling planes, and by ultra-high-speed photography of fireball growth. Another Nevada activity of the AEC was its civil effects program of tests originated by various non-military federal agencies. For example, two typical frame houses were exposed to the first blast of the series, for the Federal Civil Defense Administration. Some 50 civilian automobiles were included in this test. Several types of family and community bomb shelters were also tried out. The blast from the 16 kiloton shot hits the house at 3,500 feet, around three quarters of a mile, almost total destruction. The other house at a mile and a half showed only moderately heavy damage. These visually spectacular tests were only one portion of a big program which included extensive dosimeter and radiation research and important biomedical and genetic studies by some of the country's top scientists. The second major phase of the 1953 series, military effects tests, was, from the service point of view, the main feature of the show. All early planning and coordination of these tests was handled by the Directorate of Weapons Effects Tests, set up for this purpose by Field Command, Armed Forces Special Weapons Project. In the operational phase, personnel of this directorate were integrated into the main test organization. There, they continued to be responsible for all military tests and for the important military support given to the AEC's programs. Such support, for example, as the Air Weather Service forecasts, on which are based the fire or no fire decisions for each shot. The bulk of the huge knothole program was carried out on Frenchman Flat, though some military tests were run on the weapon development shots up on Yucca. Number nine on 8 May was the first knothole shot, an airdrop of a 26 kiloton weapon. All military tests on Frenchman Flat were originally built around this shot. The relatively high burst height, 2,400 feet, was a compromise to fit many tests, rather than to inflict maximum central damage. Shot 10, 25 May, proof tested another delivery system, the Army's 280 millimeter gun. When this shot was added to the program, some additional effects tests were scheduled to observe results of the low burst height, approximately 520 feet above ground. Since no gun-type assembly had been detonated since the Hiroshima bomb, the weapons development scientists had on this shot their first opportunity to study the nucleonic behavior and fireball configuration of such a device. Yield 15 kilotons. Unlike the situation with an implosion weapon, the scientists were here able to observe fireball growth from a body of fissionable material whose exact shape and dimensions at the moment of detonation were known. As scheduled, the military effects tests total well over 70 distinct projects under nine major program headings. Headings which might, in a sense, be considered as signposts guiding us along our road. 
the road full of questions that we followed through Knothole, one of the biggest military test programs in our records. To begin with, we wanted more and clearer data on blast and precursor phenomena, and on the Mach stem, and the triple points pad. We wanted enough data to predict what these factors, plus thermal and nuclear radiation will do, of military significance, to any living being or object they can reach. These were the objectives of our road. We haven't the time to stop for a look at every signpost along the way. We'll just have to hit some of the high spots and new spots. A project, for instance, that didn't use a new technique, but that hadn't been covered in previous report films, had for its aim to measure free field blast pressures in regions of concern to delivery aircraft and to determine the triple point height in at least one location. Two B-29s did the muscle work on the job. Just before shot nine, they dropped 14 canisters in the target area. Time to be hanging on their parachutes at burst time and a long line some 5,000 feet high and spaced out to nearly seven miles from the burst point. Each canister telemetered its altitude and surrounding air pressure to a ground station tape recorder. The tape also marked time of burst and time of shock arrival at the canister. The close-in canisters each received two kicks, one from the incident wave and one from the reflected wave. Farther out, each canister received a single kick from the mock stem, indicating that the triple point where the two waves merge had sliced up through the canister line at a distance and altitude that we could compute from the recording tapes. In the nuclear radiation program, particular interest centered on shot 10's neutron flux measurements, the first ever made on the detonation of a gun type assembly. Gold, tantalum, and sulfur threshold samples were used to detect neutron energy levels from thermal to around 10 million electron volts. The total flux per kiloton was the highest ever observed running 10 to 30 times as high as the implosion shots, 8 and 9, and extending the median lethal radiation range some 600 feet. One novel feature of upshot knothole was the first use of drone aircraft on a continental atomic test. Navy AD-2s were instrumented for blast and thermal radiation response and were flown at near critical distances from several bursts. Results indicated that comparatively moderate thermal inputs may seriously reduce the blast resistance of some aircraft components. Standard blue aircraft paint proved clearly inferior to white or unpainted metal surfaces for protection against destructive thermal effects. Similar flights by manned and instrumented Air Force B-50s and a B-36 gave structural response data needed to establish minimum safe operational parameters for high performance bombers. Other bombers from the Strategic Air Command flew in with the drop plane, testing techniques for obtaining yield, height of burst, and ground zero location, the three essential parameters of IBDA, indirect bomb damage assessment. On the biomedical program, Air Force QF-80 drones, instrumented to measure gamma radiation and with test animals aboard, were flown through atomic clouds at 30,000 and 32,000 feet. They were each controlled by primary and secondary motherships, and manned fighter escorts stood by to shoot down any drone that malfunctioned. These tests indicated that personnel of pressurized aircraft passing at 400 knots through a cloud at least four minutes old from a weapon of less than 30 kT would receive an external dosage of less than 50 rentgens with a negligible respiratory hazard. On the thermal effects program, one project concerned parked aircraft and aircraft components, an extension of previous tests. New data were obtained on structural weakening from thermal inputs too low to cause visible damage. Cloth thermal shields were proved to have considerable value in reducing damage to parked aircraft. Some aircraft fabrics were destroyed at levels as low as two calories per square centimeter, while magnesium sheet and foil-covered panels were undamaged by 20 calories. 
It was also found that strong tie-downs may protect aircraft parked nose-on to the blast from much of the damage that will occur if the plane is unmoored and free to lift and roll. But for side-on or tail-on orientations, the tie-downs may actually increase damage.